Well, this morning we're going to be going through the conclusion of the book of Ephesians. And so we are wrapping up uh, the book today. And I wanted to give kind of a little snapshot into what is coming next. As we come to next week, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting a mini-series on shepherds and servants. We are going into the phase where we are going to be preparing to see who is God raising up to serve as elders and deacons. So it's important for us to know who are those men. Who are they? What do they do? So as we look around us, we say, who has God been raising up for this? Those who lead the congregation, serve the congregation as elders and deacons, that is very important. We do not take that role lightly. So it's good for us to know who are those men? What does God say? These are the qualifications and these are their roles. So we're going to be doing that for the next three weeks starting next week. As we come back to Ephesians, we remember last week that we looked at Paul giving kind of these final instructions to the church. He's gathering the troops and he's saying, make sure you have your armor on. We saw how this was kind of a culmination of the book and how he's, he's reaching back at many different topics and things that he's talked about. And he says, I want to bring this to your attention as I give you this final kind of commissioning to say, live as the church in the world today. So this morning, we're looking at a continuation of that thought. He's, he's kind of mid-thoughts as he's sharing with the church just after that armor. And we're going to see that he says, you are to pray. You are to pray. All of this armor that you put on is to withstand what the devil brings, but he says, pray. That's the role you are to take on in spiritual warfare. So Paul spends the end of this section talking about prayer. He shares with us what is the role of prayer when we are encountering spiritual warfare. What are the details of prayer? What does that look like? What is the content of prayer? It's not just what we think is important, but he gives us instruction, says in spiritual warfare, these are things you should be praying for. So that's going to be this morning as we look at the conclusion of this book. I would love to read uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 through 24, and I encourage you, if you are able, to stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning. Again, we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 through the end of the chapter, and it says this, Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. You may be seated this morning. Now, normally, I will take some time right now to pray that we would have humble hearts before God's word, that we would have open hearts to hear what he has to say. But we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. We see that this focus is on prayer. He says, focus on praying for one another. Focus on praying that the gospel would go out, and that's going to be the main content of what we're looking at today. But I wanted to take a second and recognize something that's taken place in our community, and we're actually going to take a few minutes in the service to pray for a current event from our community. This went last week, and so on Tuesday, you may know and understand that Northwestern schools had a bus accident, 
And it was significant with a child passing away in that accident. Uh, I know there's been some significant things that have taken place and the weight and the burden uh, that is on especially that school district. Uh, And I wanted to take some time and pray together for them. It tells us we are to be praying. So I thought, how better can we do that? So there's a few things that uh, I'm going to talk about. I don't have it on the screen right now. uh, But I want you to remember, here's a few pointers for prayer this morning. First is, pray for the family that lost part of their family. As you send your kids off to school, you think of, especially the beginning of the year, the stresses and the pressures. You're hoping that they're going to make friends. They're going to enjoy their teacher. You never think of something like this taking place. Pray for the family. You may know the family. You may know the name of the family. I'm not going to mention it here, but pray specifically if you can. I would say pray for the teachers and administration at the school. Uh, I know this has been significant and heavy with them, and they have been weighing how do we give appropriate counsel, how do we lead through appropriate grief when it's a tragedy such as this. We have some members here at Southgate that are a part of the Northwestern uh, schools. Uh, If you know who they are, and so I didn't ask for their permission to mention them, but if you know who they are, be praying for them specifically because this is significant for them. It's a weight on them. They are a part of our body, but also they have the gospel. They have hope and truth, so pray that they have an opportunity to be light in darkness even in the midst of tragedy. Be praying for others that are a part of Southgate who are a part of that school system, whether it's students or other families that are connected to the school, be praying for them. I think we need to be praying for other churches who are ministering to the school. Uh, There's probably multiples and many in that area, but two that I know of that I want to bring our attention to is fellowship uh, with Pastor Jeremy Hudson. I know he has spent a lot of time Uh, at the school, and that's been significant because they're pretty close. They're closer in proximity than we are to that school system. And also, I've had some conversation with Pastor Ken Winter from HFC, also a little bit closer to us, and and they have some families that have been impacted through friendships uh, of individuals that have been impacted by the accident. So be praying for them as they are close. Pray for wisdom for them as they come to comfort. Pray that they will have the gospel, and then in a time of hurting, they will be able to share hope even in the midst of tragedy. Pray for those that are part of the school system that have the gospel. Pray that they are able to be a comfort to students, to families, to fellow teachers, to administration. I would also say pray for the first responders that were a part of helping in this situation. Uh, I know it was difficult for many of them. It's difficult anytime you come across tragedy, but to think of the scale of this with young children, it is significant. So here's what I want us to do. Uh, I would love for us to pray whether you're comfortable by yourself at this time or gather with a few people around you. Pray out loud together. It's wonderful to be able to hear God's people lifting up prayers together, even if we don't understand because we're across the room. But we're going to spend a few minutes praying through those things. And I would encourage you to do that in groups there. And I'm going to close in a few minutes this time of prayer uh, as I come back and pray uh, corporately together for us. So take a few minutes. Even if you don't know anything about them, We're going to see in today's passage that it is okay, and we are told, pray general prayers for things that we know God wants to hear from us. So take a few minutes to pray this morning. God, we do bring our burdens to you. Uh, And we think of something that happens in the community, even if it's not one of the families that are here, it impacts us. Lord, we do pray for the family that has lost a little one in their family. 
Lord, we pray that there would be those that come alongside and that can give comfort and support in this time of grief. Lord, there's going to be moments where they just need a shoulder to cry on. Provide people that can be the support that they need. God, we also pray for those that are a part of Southgates and that have been impacted, whether it's through teachers that are there, whether it's through friends that attend that school district or families that are a part of that school system. Lord, we pray that in this time of grief, we as a body would come alongside and support and care and love on them. God, I especially think of those that I know of that are uh, part of the, the teachers in that school system, the grief that they are going through, uh, the teachers that they are coming alongside that are also going through grief. Lord, we especially pray that we would give love and support and care to them so that they can be equipped and bolstered to love and care for that school system in a time of great need. God, we also think of other local churches that are a part of serving and ministering, and we're going to see in this passage that we are to pray for all the saints. So God, even those that are outside, it is important for us to lift them up in prayer. God, I'm sure there are many churches uh, that are impacted by this. I'm sure there are many churches that are reaching out. But Lord, I especially just want to pray for Fellowship, Pastor Jeremy Hudson, and the many others that have been uh, giving many t much time and many hours, being a resource and a care for that school system. God, I also think of H F uh, HFC and Pastor Ken Winter and the many others from there uh, that have also been impacted but are serving this local body or this local school district that we have in Springfield, Lord. God, we pray that you would give them strength, you would give them wisdom as they serve. I think of Courtney's words that we saw in the video that she shared, that the question would come up, why do we do this? Why do we care? It is because you first loved us. And you have commissioned us, love the world around you. God, may that be clear in the ministry that's taking place to the school at this time. Lord, we do want to ask that you would soften our hearts to your word this morning, that we would be able to see what you want to share with us from Paul's words in Ephesians. Thank you for loving us so much that you shared with us your heart through the Bible. We love you very much, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So we've read through our passage, and we've, we've seen kind of some outlines, and I again want to remind us that we're going to continue this focus on prayer through this this morning. We're going to see two main points this morning. We're going to see first the details of prayer. We're going to see also the content of prayer. We have to keep in mind the context of the passage. This is, as I said, the same thought pattern as the armor of God, and we see that the armor of God is uh, significant, and he follows it up with saying, this is prayer. So when we're in spiritual warfare, here are some focuses that we are to have in prayer here. It's buzzing on me, but it's just one second. We'll see. There we go. So here's a couple observations that we need to make about this passage as we look at it initially, before we kind of get into these main points. Uh, and so the first one is, looking at this passage, we see some repeated words. And anytime you see repeated words, you want to say, why is that there? What is the purpose? So when we look at this passage, we see the word all mentioned multiple times. So we see that we are to pray at all times with all prayer and supplication, keeping alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Why is he using this? Well, this would be kind of the equivalent if we were writing something today and you put something in bold or italics. 
You are drawing attention. You are bringing an emphasis to it saying, look at this. So what he's going and talking about is this emphasizes and then heightens the importance of prayer within spiritual warfare. He says, don't stop at putting on this armor, but rather we have action to take as we are in the battle. Don't be stagnant. What he's saying is prayer is important. This isn't a last resort when we've tried everything to solve a problem. Okay, yeah, that's right. Maybe we should pray. But rather, he says, this is a first response anytime we are in the battle. Prayer is important. Whether the struggle is large or whether it is small, prayer is to be emphasized. Paul continues to frame the use of prayer and spiritual warfare when he follows the kind of this initial instruction of prayer with three prepositional phrases. So he's got three phrases that kind of explain this, and those phrases are at all times, in the spirit, and with all prayer and supplication. So let's take a little second and say, what is, what is the importance of these? What is he talking about? So the first of these is at all times. So we see that in the passage. And this will bring up things in our minds, kind of certain passages like 1 Thessalonians 5.16, pray without ceasing. Or Romans 12.12, 12, be constant in prayer. So this isn't necessarily a new concept, uh, but he's saying this is important for us. Now, as we look at this, uh, we kind of, we're looking at, and, and this can bring on a point of guilt, And prayer is one area, whenever you're preaching or whenever you're in a Bible study or whenever you're talking with others, there's always this guilt that I never live up to this bar or the standard of praying at all times. One, because it's like, is that really possible? How do I get anything else accomplished if we're praying at all times? Now, that's only if we think that prayer is a formal prayer time where we're with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, our hands folded as we were taught when we were little. Yes, that's impossible. We can't do that at all times. Even looking at the life of Jesus, we see he didn't do that all the time. There were conversations that he had with his disciples. Now, it wasn't like he was saying, hey, disciples, we are supposed to be praying at all times. So every other word that I say with you, I'm going to say to the heavenly father, my heavenly father. And no, that would be weird. That would be, they would be like, what are you doing? So that's not what he's talking about. But rather, in looking at the life of Jesus, we see this example. We see what that looks like. What it is is that Jesus, at all times, had a conscious understanding and a response to knowing that God was at work in everything, at all times, in every situation. Something didn't happen, and it was compartmentalized and didn't involve his heavenly father. You think of the various situations, and the Samaritan woman, for example, going up and getting water, he could have just said, oh, there's some lady there. I'm going to wait till she's done. She can go do her thing, and then I'll get some water, uh, whatever. But no, he said, this is a divine appointment. This, the God the Father placed me and her at the same time, and he was able to have a conversation with her and use that as a teaching tool for the disciples. You think of every time that he's talking with the Pharisees. That wasn't just an argument that came up or someone that had disagreement, so it's like, hey, let's duke it out a little bit, see who can be the the smartest as we talk about Scripture. No, he was very intentional in how he responded It wasn't only for the Pharisees that he was talking, but those that were listening. He was communicating to the disciples, to the people in the town where he was at, and to the Pharisees. Those weren't random situations where he was caught off guard and had to respond. No, that was a divine appointment. We could go through many, many more of those types of situations where Jesus was fully aware of what was going on and said, God the Father is at work. We notice even from the life of Jesus where he got to the point where he says, yes, I need at this point to go have a time of formal communication with my heavenly Father, with my Father. 
So he spent some time away and said, yes, I need to spend this time dedicated time in prayer. Whether he knew something was coming or whether he knew something was in that day, you think especially of uh, the time that Jesus prayed in the garden just before his death. That was significant. He was getting there and saying, I need communion with my father before I go through this difficulty. He called those some around him and said, pray with me. He knew what was coming and said, this is going to be difficult. I need some of that extra time with my father, telling him my burdens, sharing with him at that time. Prayer is that communication at all times. It's for us understanding that no matter what takes place, everything is in the sphere of God at work in our lives. Now, here's a significant struggle that we have. We are pretty good at compartmentalizing different areas of our life. We have our work life. When we're away from work, generally, we don't want to talk about work because that's just over there. We have our family lives, and often, whether we're coming home from work or something's come up, we prepare for things that are taking place in our family lives. Our calendars reflect this. I can think of my calendar, and if I were to look it up, family things are in yellow, work things are in purple. And so just to keep things separate so I know how things are going, we compartmentalize and we separate different things. We think of also the school life. And so I'll I'll take care of these things and then I can go do this. We have our friend's life and so our social life. We also have all sorts of, of different things, our leisure lives, things that we do for fun. We break those up and it's like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Once I accomplish that, I can move to this. Then I can go to this. We follow our calendars to a T at different times so we can fit everything in. What's unfortunate is that there are certain times that we have our church life. And then I'll start at 9 or 9.30, go through 12, and then, hey, we'll pick it back up again next week. Or there's different times when we have our relationship with God life. And there's times where if he's lucky, we can carve out 10 to 15 minutes with him in the morning or evening, whether we're praying or reading his word. Unfortunately, that's not how life works. There's a problem with that thinking because whether we like to admit it or not, God is intimately involved in every aspect of our lives. We need to recognize that. Understanding that is a part of saying this communication with God, this communicating with him at all times. Whether it's we have a discipline item with our children. Understanding that God may be using that for our sanctification as parents, and that is to be a teaching time, an instructional time with our children whether it's something taking place at work and it's just like, I can't handle one of my coworkers for this, that, or the other reason. Understanding that God has us in those situations for a specific purpose. What is your purpose in that situation? When we have this regular communication with God, we start to see the world a little bit differently. We start to see every single situation a little bit differently. So we say in spiritual warfare, this is all parts of life. As you go into prayer, have that level of understanding that God's at work in that time of prayer at all times. The second phrase that we have, oh no, this, this, this will be good. Uh, as we think about kind of this enveloping everything that we are. It's this idea from Colossians 3, 2. It says, set your minds on things that are below, uh, above, not on things that are on the earth. He's saying we need to think differently. We need to have our minds programmed a little differently and say, God, transform my heart, transform my mind so I see things the way that you see things. I see people the way that you see people. I develop compassion for people the way that you do. We need to recognize that God has infiltrated all different compartments of our life. Nothing's separate from God. 
praying at all times. So now the second one we see is in the Spirit. Now, to pray in the Spirit does not mean that we need to have a special prayer language or to be speaking in tongues. It doesn't mean we need to have something miraculous come and change the way that we are and the way that we communicate with God. Rather, we need to see this phrase in light of Romans 8, verses 26 through 27. It says this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit prays for us on our behalf when we don't know what to say. In essence, he's correcting our prayers when it's at times we're asking for the wrong things. The Holy Spirit is there to guide and correct What we need to see through this is that we need to have, we need to desire prayers that are in line with the heart of the Spirit of God. We need to be submitting our desires to God and asking for Him to change our desires to be more like Him. I don't believe praying that God would give me a giant bowl of ice cream is necessarily in His will. It would not be good for my health. So me thinking through those things and saying, what should I be praying for? That's trying to think and say, what does God want from me? As I look at his word, what does he want changed in me? What does he want me to be doing for him? How can he be empowering me to be a light to the nations in different areas? So part of this is saying, God, transform my heart my mind, my prayers to be in alignment with the spirits. The Holy Spirit is God. So as we pray in the spirit, as we ask to have our desires, our will aligned to him, we are saying, God, I want to be aligned with your heart's desires. That changes the way we think about that coworker. And saying, God, just give me tolerance for them. I don't want to get fired and I'm getting frustrated with them. But rather it changes, say, God, how can I be praying for them? How can I figure out what's important in their life and to be encouraging them? It changes the way that we pray for one another as a body. It changes the way we pray for our families. Again, we want to see with God's eyes around us. Be praying in the Spirit. Now, we're going to look in a second as what specifically is his desire as we look at uh, spiritual warfare. But before we get there, we kind of have already seen, even in, in Ephesians, that Paul encouraged the church to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He says in Ephesians 5.18, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. He's telling the church at that point, be controlled by the Spirit. Submit yourself to the Spirit. Be aligned to what the Spirit wants for you, His leading and direction and His desires for you. That should also impact our prayers in spiritual warfare. The third one that we see is with all prayer and supplication. With all prayer and supplication. Paul's using two different words here to kind of give us a little bit of perspective on what we should be praying for. He uses these words prayer and supplication. If we were to do a study in these words, we'd understand this word prayer to mean general prayers or requests. General requests that we make to God. Supplication is specific requests that we make to God. What he's telling us through this is there's not one specific way or one specific thing that we should be praying for when it relates to spiritual warfare. 
But he's saying there's going to be times where we pray for things generally. We pray for the body as a whole. We pray for God to be working in a certain area. And then there's going to be times where we know something specific has happened. A brother or a sister is going through a difficult time and we say, God, please be in this situation. Bring comfort and peace. I think of the prayer time we had earlier. There are some in this room that have no connection to anybody from Northwestern. That's just the way it is. But we can still pray general requests because we know bits and pieces of what God's will is for those people a part of the school system. There are some in here that are very closely connected to Northwestern. So there are some that probably know some of the names of the other children that are on that bus. They know some of the families. They've been working with them. So you can pray very specifically because you know exactly what some of those significant needs are. As we think about spiritual warfare, he's saying we have opportunities to pray for general things and very pinpointed specific things. They're both important. There's a variety of communication that takes place in prayer, whether we're making those general requests to God or whether we have very specific items that are specific, significant burdens that we bring to his feet. Paul goes on to give us an example of what one of those specific requests are as he gives us the content of prayer. I want to come back, and there's a reason I keep reminding us of this. This is in the context of spiritual warfare. There are a lot of things that we can see that we can be praying for. So as we go through this, this isn't the only thing that we are to be praying for. We could look at uh, Jesus' prayer that he shared with the disciples. That has a lot of different topics, a lot of different things to be praying for. But as it relates to spiritual warfare, he says this should be a priority for us. The first one of those is pray for the saints. That's what he's going through, and he says, pray for all the saints. Not just pray for the saints, he says, pray for me also. So we are to be praying for one another. This falls directly in line with the message that we've been seeing from this whole book, that we as a church are a community. We aren't a bunch of individuals going about doing our own thing, but we are connected together. We are encouraging one another. We are to be praying for one another. This is to be a focus on the body rather than ourselves. At no point does he say, pray for you in this. But he says, pray for the saints as it relates to the spiritual warfare. The church is a unit and not a bunch of individuals. This prayer is one that's to be done in a sense of urgency. With alertness and perseverance, we are to be praying for one another. Once again, Paul uses this word supplication, which we see meaning those specific requests. We should not wait or delay. When we know something is taking place in the life of someone else in the church, lift that up to the Lord immediately. You can do it later also but we are to be doing that with urgency. This indicates that we are to know each other well. It's hard to pray for someone else specifically when you don't know them well. When we just walk in, sit in the back row, and head out, we don't build those relationships. We don't get to know each other. We need to be committed to building relationship with one another. Hospitality, having meals with one another, talking with one another, being a part of the Equip You classes where we kind of just go back and forth and say, how are you doing with this? How are, we, how are you going through this situation? Getting to know each other is the way that we're able to pray specifically for one another. It's kind of like when you find out something that has taken place And you pray for it in a general sense first because you're like, man, I I know so-and-so is going through a difficult situation. I'm going to be praying for it. And then you've been praying for them, so you have this burden. So you see them on a Sunday morning and you go up and you say, how is this going? 
And they say, you know, it, it's been hard or it's been going good. They say, here's where we're at right now with that. Then you can get way more specific. But that's because you had a heart of prayer for the body. It's in these situations that deeper conversations can take place and we find out how each other are really doing. This gives us an opportunity to pray specifically for one another. Now, this is praying for the saints. Content of our prayers. Paul also tells us that another part of our prayer should be praying for the proclamation of the gospel. He's saying, I, I want you to be praying for me that, that I'll be clear, that I'll have opportunity, that when the situation arises, I will be able to share the gospel with those that I am around. Not only is this a focus on praying for one another, but it's more specific, praying that we are to be uh, praying for one another to have gospel opportunities in life. This is a unique situation where Paul says, pray for me that I do this. Paul doesn't often have a focus on himself. He's so focused on everyone else. But when it comes to himself, he says, the prayer that I want you to have for me is pray that I share the gospel well. What's interesting is that Paul did not pray that the, the scars on his ankles would heal well because of the stocks that he's in when he's in prison. He's not saying pray that my, that my wrists will heal up because of the chains that I'm in. He doesn't say, pray that I get out of jail so I can, I can go share the gospel in other areas. He doesn't have those prayers for the physical things necessarily when we're talking about spiritual warfare. But his mindset is thinking, pray that no matter where I am, the gospel will be the priority. That's significant for him. Pray that when we're Praying for each other to have those gospel opportunities is significant, whether it be with family members, co-workers, neighbors, loved ones, having opportunities, praying for one another. A lot of times when we get to know each other, we're like, hey, so-and-so is coming to the house this weekend. They're in town. And knowing they're not believers, say, hey, I'll pray that you have good gospel-focused conversations. They're like, man, it's been rough the last couple months that we've met together. They just kind of push it away. I have been a part of a couple different prayer groups where like, man, people were praying, and they're like, something weird happened. They asked me a question about the gospel. Pray for one another to have those opportunities. Pray that when we're at sporting events, music events, school events, entertainment events, or any leisure activity, that we'd have a focus of turning normal, everyday conversations to have a little gospel impact. Allowing people to know this is important to us. Paul also talks that we need to be praying for boldness as we proclaim the gospel. Praying for clarity as we declare the gospel. Pray that we never lose focus that we are ambassadors for Christ. We need to be sharing his message. That's why we're here on his behalf. This is how we pray for one another. Pray that we are faithful to Christ's commission that he gives us. Praying that we're faithful to this passage here, Mark 16, 15. He said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole of creation. That's what we pray for one another. Let's pray for one another to be faithful in that exact mission. Now, the rest of this passage, we're not going to go into it in depth like we have, but we see even in this closing that Paul gives to the church, he has an others-focused mentality. Others focused in the way that he says, church, I want to care for you by sending Tychicus, someone that's been along with me who'll be able to share where we're at, what we're doing, kind of the state of the gospel and with our current situation, but I also send him so he can encourage you. So he has a focus on the church. He also talks very highly of Tychicus. And so he's speaking very highly, saying, this is someone who has been faithful in ministry. None of this is focused on himself. 
He's lifting others up, having that focus on others as he expresses high praise for Tychicus, and he expresses the mission of Tychicus is to encourage the church body. He closes with a benediction or a blessing for the believers, asking for God to give divine blessing to them and expressing his love for the believers. We'll close with that in just a minute, but I want us to be thinking about a couple things as we think of application. First is, prayer is a priority if we believe spiritual warfare is real. It's a priority. It's a real thing. It's something we're going to invest ourselves in if we believe spiritual warfare is real. If we don't, there's no reason to pray. Except for all God commands us to. We're supposed to do that. But when we see things through God's eyes, when we have a heart that is sensitive to his desires and his will, we realize there is a lot going on in the world today. And what we are called to do, our our response and our call to action is to pray to our Heavenly Father, lifting up one another. A second thing is that prayer needs to include a focus on the spiritual realm and specifically the power of the gospel in that realm. All too often, our prayers sometimes primarily revolve around the physical and what's going on in this earth. I had someone tell me one time, and I got to remember this correctly as I say it, is that we pray more often for people to stay out of heaven than we do for them to go to heaven. I'll give you a second on that one. We pray more for our physical lives on this earth to be extended rather than having a concern for others to be with Christ one day in heaven. We need to have that focus on spiritual things for one another that are taking place. Pray that we do not fall into any kind of spiritual or moral failure and hinder our ability to genuinely share the gospel with others around us. Pray for humility and that pride won't blind us from the power of the gospel that needs to work in us. We are not completed individuals. None of us are. We will not be until we are one day at home with our Heavenly Father. So pray that we are humble, needing to be changed by the gospel. Pray that fear of man does not keep us from sharing the one thing that can set man free, the truth of the gospel. I want to close this morning with that benediction that Paul gave to the church. So my prayer this morning is going to be this. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus with love incorruptible. Amen. You can go in peace this morning.